Session 5 will cover the outlook for Myanmar and Thailand. This session will be moderated by Professor Joseph Leo, Dean of the S. Raja Ratnam School of International Studies, Nanyang Technological University, Singapore. Professor Leo, please. Thank you. Good, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I was given explicit instructions that I am to claw back as much time as possible for all of us. So I shall not say any more except to introduce very quickly our speakers. We have three eminent speakers and we are very uh, pleased uh, to have them here with us. We have uh, Drs. Tan Min Wu, uh, Wong Yit Fan, and uh, last but certainly not least, uh, Titinan Pong Su Dirak from uh, Chula in, in Thailand. Um, their detailed CVs are in your, your uh, brief, so uh, please have a look uh, at them. Uh, without further ado, can I invite uh, the first speaker, Dr. Tat, please. They will speak for 15 minutes. Uh, my apologies because uh, beforehand, because I will cut you off uh, after 15 minutes, as per the instruction given to me. So. <laughs> Thank you very much. I'm very grateful for the opportunity to be here and to speak to such a distinguished audience. I was thinking a little bit earlier of exactly how to start, and I was going to say something along the lines of Myanmar being at a critical inflection point, but I've been saying that every year for the past six or seven years, and I, and I think that in a way, you know, maybe what's more important about Myanmar today is, is almost two years into this new government led by Doan San Suu Kyi and the National League for Democracy, and more recently with the violence in, in Rakhine State and the exodus of, of Rohingya refugees to Bangladesh, I think what we can say for certain is that the old way of thinking about Myanmar no longer applies. And perhaps that's a good thing, because I think the old way had its drawbacks, was very simplistic, and in a way covered up much of the complexity about the country. For a long time, especially from the outside and especially from the West and in the media, Myanmar was seen as a sort of black hole of dictatorship. And then all of a sudden, in 2011, there was this sudden, inexplicable, unexplained, almost miraculous change. And both those advocating sanctions and those advocating engagement claimed credit. There was actually little attempt at the time to understand the real causes and drivers of change. And there was little, then, then there was the assumption that Myanmar was already then on a fixed track to democracy, peace, prosperity, and free market-based development, and an assumption as well that all of these things would reinforce one another. You had this high point of this good feeling about the Myanmar story back around 2012, 2013, with the chairmanship of ASEAN, with the World Economic Forum Summit in Naypyidaw, with, the, with Myanmar hosting the Southeast Asian Games, with the President uh, Obama's visit. And in 2012 as well, the by-elections, free by-elections, which were won by the NLD and Aung San Suu Kyi herself coming into parliament as a member of parliament. There were so many positive feelings that no one then tried to question uh, the narrative that had been set, and no one really probed any further in terms of why the changes that were happening in that time, the political liberalization uh, of 2011, 2012, why these things were actually taking place. And there was a good feeling, I think, because of a sense that however good these ex-generals were in government at pushing reforms, things could only get better because perhaps around the corner in 2015, 2016, there would be an NLD government. And so things could only progress in Myanmar. And this happy final chapter in the story was meant to begin in 2016. You had the landslide victory of the NLD in 2015. And again, it's this renewed sense that Myanmar was on the way up, on the route to becoming a peaceful, liberal democracy in Asia's next frontier economy. By later in the year, there were grumblings, at least in the Myanmar political class, over the government's handling of the economy, over the handling of the peace process, but these were still quite easy to ignore. But then came, by late 2016, a crisis that was impossible to ignore and began to shift I think irrevoc irrevocably uh, people's perceptions 
of the country. You had the first attacks by ARSA, the Arakan Rohingya Solidarity Army in October 2016, just as Kofi Annan was beginning his work as the chairman of a new government appointed advisory commission. And this led to uh, not only to allegations of attacks on, on civilians, but a substantial exodus of, of refugees as well. Then this past August, you had another much bigger set of ARSA attacks followed by a fierce army counteroffensive, the wholesale burning of villages, displacement in the area, and then this gigantic wave of refugees, tens of thousands of, of non-Muslim south, and then a much bigger exodus of over 600, 700,000 people of Muslims, Rohingya Muslims, across the border into Bangladesh. By that time, the sort of good feelings about the Myanmar story came to a, a screeching halt, and especially in the West, and for people who had followed a fairly singular story about Myanmar, uh, there was deep shock and a sense that what was happening on the ground was, was really uh, not consonant at all with people's understandings of Myanmar and where it was going. In a way, I think what, we, what is happening is that people are catching up with the realities in Myanmar and many of the complexities in the country. Over the last six years, you had this narrative of a, of a miraculous transition, but people tended to nudge aside all those things that were already happening in Myanmar that were not in line with the, with the good news story. You had the collapse of ceasefires in Myanmar beginning in 2011 and an escalation or a surge in armed conflict uh, that was far greater than anything that had been seen over the, period, uh, over the pe uh, previous few years. You had the beginnings of communal violence in, in Rakhine itself in 2012, displacing over 100,000 people, spreading to central Myanmar in 2013. And you also had something very different, which was, I think, a sense that free markets uh, were not necessarily the answer in Myanmar. I think anyone who visited Myanmar over these past few years would realize that this mantra of free market reform wasn't something that was necessarily sticking within society as a whole, um, and that people were very doubtful of exactly what path to development Myanmar should take. And also, in a way, something that was not really consonant with people's sort of thinking about Myanmar was the Uthain Sein government itself and what to make of a group of ex-generals who were never meant to be part of the story of Myanmar's transition. And linked as well to this old narrative with this, was this almost Manichaean view that's still around very much today, which is a tendency to see everything in Myanmar as a struggle between the army and its opponents, and to see Myanmar society as this timeless, blameless victim of oppression, which is only there waiting uh, to embrace the values of a liberal democracy. The question always in the media and from the outside was, has Myanmar really changed, meaning has the army really begun to give up power? Whereas in fact, I think this dichotomy that's set between the army and the rest is at best inefficient in explaining what is happening or what has happened and most likely muddies our understanding of the, of the actual situation on the ground. And I think for these reasons, now is as, time, as good a time as any to go back to the drawing board and to think more carefully about what is Myanmar today and where is it going. There has been a lot of progress over the past five, six years. I think anyone who goes to Yangon today and sees signs of, of, of change and positive change and, and development um, and sees, of course, the political progress in Naypyidaw with the NLD government in office and Aung San Suu Kyi uh, in her position as state councillor. But I think it's important also to understand again why change began to happen in 2011. This wasn't a miraculous transformation. The constitution that we have now, which is a hybrid constitution, is more or less exactly what the army first proposed in the mid-1990s, but which was rejected at the time by both the NLD and also by many Western governments. A lot of people from the outside say, why did the generals finally change? In a way, the question is the reverse. Why did the opposition agree to a constitution which they had dismissed 20 years before? And why did Washington agree to accept a setup which they had said in the 1990s was far short of democracy and therefore could not be accepted. You had in the late 2000s, Cyclonargus, you had the monks uprising, all of this set the context. 
Even more important in terms of driving change was the decision by the two senior generals at the time, Senior General Dan Shui and Senior General Mao Ye, to retire and to set the stage for their retirement, the appointment of new generals to head the armed forces as well. Then you had the, the person of, of Uthain Sein himself and very specific intra-elite dynamics and very specific personalities around the president who decided on a reformist program of political liberalization, which happened, or because it happened, at exactly the same time that Washington was looking to engage Naypyidaw and engage the military regime, led also to the very quick relaxation of sanctions, the visit of Hillary Clinton in, in late 2011, and the consolidation of that specific shift out of military dictatorship. All of this political change was also happening at a time of very rapid economic and social change as well. It wasn't happening over a static Myanmar society. You had this enormous influence from China, from Yunnan, especially over the economy in the north of the country. You had the enormous impact of the migration of millions of people over the past 10, 15 years from Myanmar to Thailand, um, sending back money into a, a remittance economy that was probably Myanmar's biggest export. You had uh, the quickening of urbanization. You had deep social inequalities building up, especially in urban areas. You had the alienation of people from land. You had severe environmental degradation. You had the degrading of public services, especially health and education. And in the uplands of Myanmar, this vast landscape of violence, illicit economies, ethnic armed groups, militia, and at least 400,000 people who had been displaced in armed conflict over the past decade. Then on top of this, you had this telecoms revolution from 2012 to 2015, when everyone in Myanmar suddenly had not just telephones, but smartphones, and were connected to the internet after the freeing up of the media as well. I think it's very possible if we look ahead in Myanmar that we will see progress across the range of issues, even the very difficult issues in, uh, in Rakhine State, there is certainly a lot of hope and expectation, especially amongst the young generation of people in Myanmar today. But I think Myanmar also has some very unique challenges. In some ways, some of the things that Myanmar is facing, extreme poverty, armed conflict, ethnic conflict, are things that we've seen throughout uh, Southeast Asia. But Myanmar is coming very late into the game, and in a way is uniquely not ready to rejoin the rest of the world because of its long history of both self-imposed isolation as well as international sanctions. Myanmar is trying to join the rest of the world at a time when it is by far, uh, or not by far, but one of the poorest and weakest countries in the region at a time of breakneck technological change around the world and also climate change around the world and also at home. It's a country that's burdened by the mental legacies of isolation, not, at least, not least in elite levels, um, and by state institutions that have evolved over time in isolation for five decades, uh, essentially around a counterinsurgency agenda. And Myanmar has as well very special issues around identity. Like some other countries in the region, Myanmar is a country with literally dozens of different languages, many different religions, but it's also a country that is unfinished in, in many different ways. You have the uplands of Myanmar, which even in British times were not directly ruled and have never come under any state control in modern times. Exactly a hundred years ago in 1918, modern politics in Myanmar was born. The first political movements and parties emerged as an anti-immigration movement, at least in part, against the millions of ethnic Indians that were coming in when Burma was part of British India. And because of that, and because nationalism developed in the 20s and 30s, in part in opposition to this idea that Myanmar was part of India, the politics of race and ethnicity have been central to the DNA of Myanmar politics again since its birth. And this question of who belongs in the country and who doesn't belong, where the borders of these two big civilizations of India and China next door end, and where the civilization of Myanmar with its many different peoples and languages and religions uh, starts, is this central question in Myanmar today. So who are the different minorities in Myanmar? Who is part of the Myanmar polity and who needs to be excluded 
to draw these lines more clearly has been a huge part of the Myanmar political debate, again, for, for 100 years. And this, of course, is related to the situation in Rakhine, where the very name Rohingya, because as a name that implies that the Rohingya are an indigenous group in Rakhine state is both embraced by the Rohingya themselves, but is then rejected by the Rakhine who would like to see them as not being part of the body politic, not being part of the Myanmar nationality. And it is this crisis in, in, in Rakhine that has of course brought this old Myanmar narrative that I mentioned before to an end. And my fear is that with the crisis in Rakhine, that the problems are really only just beginning, that we are at only the first chapter in this story of how Myanmar deals with this particular issue and this particular part of the country. The government in Naypyidaw has said that it is, um, okay, I'll, I'll move very fast. On the Rakhine, I, I think the government in Naypyidaw has said that it will uh, facilitate the repatriation of refugees. I'm very doubtful that this will be able to happen uh, in, in, a, in a short period of time. And renewed violence is possible, both in Rakhine and uh, a worse scenario, of course, would be that violence and communal violence spreads uh, to the rest of the country. Let me just skip a few of the other things that I was going to say and just in closing say that even though a number of things, the peace process, uh, economic reform seems to be uh, moving very slowly, if at all, there are three big wheels in motion in Myanmar today that are less visible but very important to appreciate. The first is, I guess, what we could call the insertion of the old opposition, the National League for Democracy, into this new and evolving state. And I can say more about that if you want. But you have a situation in Napier that no one could have imagined 10 years ago of not just Aung San Suu Kyi, but all of her colleagues, many of them former political prisoners, living and working in the city built by General Dan Shui 10 years ago, uh, with generals, with ex-generals. And in a way, by working together around some of these complex issues, even though there are tensions, there are differences, there are rivalries, there is a coming together that is unfinished yet, and I think that story is, is, is yet to fully, uh, fully mature. The second is related to what I mentioned before. There is a new nationalism that is growing that is still inchoate, that could be very exclusive or could be more ex inclusive, and I think that is also something that we will see more clearly in the years to come, and especially around the next elections in 2020. And then we have China, which is the elephant coming into the room right now. And at a time when relations with the West are uh, cooling, at a time when the government knows that it has to perform better on the economy and attract investment, especially big investment in, uh, in infrastructure, China's offers of, through the Belt Road, through other schemes, of financing and making possible infrastructure projects suddenly seems very attractive. And exactly how that works, how it links with the peace process, how it links even with the crisis in Rakhine, will also be a very important thing. And very lastly, just to say that the wheel that doesn't seem to be in motion is uh, any real debate in the country on uh, the future of the, of the economy. I don't mean that in a very narrow sense, but in the broader sense. Uh, and this lack of a vision on the future political economy of the country, on the kind of Myanmar that people want 20, 30 years further down the road, I think has the danger of being filled by uh, a much more ethnocentric nationalism. And so I think this dichotomy in a way between whether or not this new political space that is real, this new political, free political space that is real, is filled by a very race-based or ethnic-based nationalism, or whether or not any of the political parties will articulate a real economic agenda going forward, I think will shape a lot of the country uh, for many decades to come. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Dr. Wong. Just a quick word to thank um, my sis for inviting me. It's an honor and a pleasure to be here. And um, let me start with a few numbers. 
GDP growth is about 7 or 8 percent you know, between the last uh, 2012 to 2015, 16. It's come down to about 6 or 7 percent. Inflation, 8 to 10 percent. Current account deficits, fiscal deficits between 4 to 5 percent of GDP, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and now forget about all these numbers. They reflect fairly benign situation. Um, they're boring and even misleading, I would say. Following what uh, Dr. Tan Minu just talked about, the, the situation in, in Yanwa, um, in a sense, defies real forecast, um, forecasting. Um, it, you have seen investors, you have seen businessmen being caught wrong-footed time and a time and a time again, and I, I suspect it will continue to happen for quite a long time. And some, some reasons are related to the complexity that Dr. Tan Minu talked about, but there are also, there are also new emerging and, um, forces at play that have come about um, in the last five years, and they will come about in the next five to ten years. And this includes, all of us know, the new connectivity revolution, um, politics being turned on its head, and the dynamics within that sphere and, um, and space um, um, uh, still being very, very fluid. And, um, and different areas of the economy moving in different directions compared to what traditionally we have seen, you know, um, economies move uh, towards export manufacturing and then moving up the uh, value-added ladder, etc., cetera, et cetera. Um, the flying geese type of uh, uh, development that we have seen in different um, uh, phases in, uh, in our regional economies. Those, I don't think, will apply. Those are somewhat dated, and I think we are in a brave new world, and we will see new forces at play. The cross-currents, if there's anything, if there's anything that I'll leave um, you with in this short segment, is that the cross-currents um, at play within the Myanmar economy and country as a whole are, I've never seen um, um, this degree and this powerful nature of cross-currents um, happening as I've seen in Myanmar compared to other frontier economies. I've worked in Vietnam, Cambodia, I'm also working in um, East Timor. But in Myanmar, they take on a different degree and different reality, um, um, in, in especially on the ground for businesses. That's the main message that I like to um, communicate in this uh, short segment. And I would like to just jump into a few other noteworthy points and leave you with that, and we can address and take that further if we have time in the uh, um, question and answer period. First of all, um, a lot of business people and a lot of many, many investors are extremely disappointed when NLD, Dong Aung San Suu Kyi, came into power and took over the economic uh, running of the country. Um, let's not be so uh, judgmental, I would say. First of all, um, President Tenzin's regime actually did a fantastic job. They released a whole wave of um, important reforms and regulations. Credit must be given where credit is due, and they did a fantastic job. And in doing so, the last government had set a benchmark against which this new government, the NLD, was to be measured. Yeah? And not only that, not only that, but 
the low hanging fruits of regulatory reforms had been taken, I think, during this first wave. Lastly, the part that is really, really difficult and challenging in Myanmar is not the writing of new reforms, uh, regulations. It's actually implementation, execution on the ground. And this, and this is the real difficulty in Myanmar. And the NLD has fallen into this space here, into this time uh, period, where execution and implementation are key. And so it's a very, very difficult phase uh, in Myanmar. This is, this is perhaps operating as uh, someone who uh, work with startups, business community, investors, execution and um, operations um, are the most challenging part about Myanmar. So it is not surprising that um, we have gotten this view of the NLD not being very competent, um, but they themselves too have, um, have, have some blame to be accrued to them. I mean, they took the eye off the ball in terms of managing the economy. They excessively prioritized um, um, the peacemaking process. It's important, but uh, yeah, they excessively fixated on that. And lastly, the uh, advisors are not the people who would be able to execute and operationalize effectively. Yeah? They are the ones who would write regulations, and, uh, new visions and all that stuff, but really, they don't have the type of people that they need to bring forth this phase of execution and implementation. Um, I would like to go to just a few areas of risk that have to be mentioned. And the first and foremost is what everybody says, it's the banking sector. The banking sector could see a crisis in the next two to three years. It is not unlike, it is not unlike a phase that we have seen in Vietnam during 2009 to 2014, somewhat there. And what Vietnam went through was basically they had a, the SOEs growing phenomenally, grabbing all kinds of activities from tourism, property development, uh, shipping, etc., etc., and borrowing to the hilt. And of course, the banks, the banks were their partners and uh, 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 actors in crime basically lent all the way. The banks, the banking sector in Vietnam basically was the reason why Vietnam was trapped in a subpar growth uh, phase for a long time, five, six, seven years. Nearly the same thing could happen, I think, in the case of Myanmar. Myanmar's banks have been growing 40% per year per annum for the last four or five years. Just imagine that. Most of the lending, collateral-based property, which has basically collapsed. During that last four or five years, we had, in place of the SOEs in Vietnam, we had a group of, um, let's say, um, uh, um, uh, business people and, and, and uh, um, uh, conglomerates who borrowed to the hilt, grabbed every asset they could see, moved into tourism, hotel property, um, agriculture, and whatever you can think of. And in doing that, they have put themselves in a situation where they are very, very much like Vietnam in 2009. My fear, my fear is that if the government authorities don't take uh, firm action on the banks and the banking lobby, believe you me, the banking lobby is one of the strongest lobbies in Myanmar. Um, if the government authorities don't take firm action and get these banks to get the act together, or 
open up the banking sector competition by foreign banks or by non-bank financial institutions like consumer finance and all that, I think um, the chances of Myanmar going down the Vietnam 2009-2014 phase is extremely high. And that will be extremely sad simply because, as we have heard this morning, in the next three, four, four years maybe, the global, the regional economies are going to go uh, uh, be very positive or has a chance of uh, uh, seeing very good growth. And the investment opportunities um, for businesses and investors in these other countries will basically take away any interest in Myanmar in the next three to four years if the banks and if the authorities don't actually follow up on the risk that I've just spoken about. Um, I would like to basically um, move towards a little bit of a uh, 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 direction in terms of um, talking about where Yanmar's positive angles are. And I think one of the most interesting areas that is um, popping up in Myanmar is that segment of startups, SMEs. For the first time, for the first time in, I mean, in Myanmar and in, I suspect in many other countries, we see the level playing, uh, a, a more level playing field um, for startups and SMEs, especially in Myanmar with the um, communications revolution, where SIM card has basically fallen the cost from $450 five years ago to $1 now, where I can download my emails even faster than in Thailand sometimes, uh, um, where um, uh, different types of uh, funding, crowdfunding, um, private equity um, type of funding, is coming in, we are seeing we are seeing small startups who are not wedded to the old ways of doing things that the big conglomerates um, have, uh, follow and where they have huge hordes of staff still uh, weighing down on their cost. We are seeing startups and SMEs starting to take market share from this old type conglomerates and companies. And that, I believe, is extremely positive because we know what small, medium-sized companies do in terms of creating jobs uh, and employment. We know what it does in terms of distribution of income, and we know what it does in terms of creating a dynamic, creative society. I have an incubator for startups in Myanmar, and the type of startups and the people who actually I come across, the young people I come across, I would say simply because they are so much more hungry, they are in an environment where there, as I said, there's a communication revolution, there is different types of funding, um, uh, politics is now turned on its head where connections were, were, were positive, now they actually work the reverse. We are, I'm actually seeing um, much more prominent, prominent um, uh, achievements uh, on the startup and SME front. And I am really encouraged by this. And I think it could take Myanmar into a different direction from what our regional uh, economies are used to. Um, those are my points. I think I have kept to the time. And uh, I'll just stop then. Thank you very much. You have, indeed. Thank you, please. Good, <clears throat> Good afternoon. Uh, I think we're on Thai time. We're not on Singaporean time. Uh, we started a little bit late. I saw that the clock had uh, 60 minutes. We were supposed to have 90 minutes, but now there's only 17 minutes. So I'll try to keep to my 15, and we'll have a two-minute Q&A. So prepare your questions and comments. Um, I just want to talk about three things. First, uh, elections and luxury watches. 
We're talking about time, so we can talk about watches. And second, about Thailand's uh, twin transitions. Uh, and then finally, what to do and how to get there. Three parts. So the, uh, the material that I'm, I'm, I'm basing my, my talk, my comments on, is from the, uh, the notes that I prepared from Mustafa, but also the, the Straits Times op-ed that I did uh, last, uh, last Saturday on the 6th of January. So you can look at that for more, for more detail. Uh, Thailand will have an election. I don't know when. People keep asking me, will there be elections this year? Last year they also asked me, and I said, uh, yeah, there will be elections eventually. Uh, that's not the main point. The main point is what happens uh, uh, when we have an election, what happens before it and, and, and after the election. So I think all things being equal, there will be an election within this year, and the reason is because of luxury watches. Now, I have a watch, you all have watches, uh, I presume, and you know, I don't know how much your watch is worth, uh, maybe 100 Singaporean dollars, maybe 200, maybe less. In Thailand, the Deputy Prime Minister, General Prawit Bongsawan, he wears watches that are worth upwards to 100,000 Singaporean dollars. 100,000 Singaporean dollars. And not just one, but now they've counted up to 16. So this would be brands that I hadn't heard of before, like uh, Richard Mill. Richard Mill is a very expensive watch. You have to watch out. Um, and then, of course, the, the Patek Philippe's and then all the, the, the Rolexes and so on. But uh, all these watches, he's been wearing them for a long time. I mean, he, you know, he's a general. So the general in Thailand, they get paid about $2,000 a month, U.S. dollars. And then, you know, uh, his assets are in the uh, multi-millions. Uh, and his watches, you know, to wear a $100,000 watch, you, you have a pretty, uh, pretty big base. Uh, and pretty deep pocket, a lot of uh, uh, liquidity and net worth. Uh, well, now he's been wearing his watches for a long time. Suddenly now, it's a problem for him. You know, he's, he's in hiding because, uh, virtually in hiding, he doesn't want to face the public because uh, all the questions that are geared to the Deputy Prime Minister and Defense Minister of Thailand is about his watches. And he doesn't have the answers for them. So he says uh, his friends lent it to him. Also, he wears his uh, diamond rings. So he said, you know, the, his mother gave it to him. Um, you know, so the friends, and then they want to know about the friends. He doesn't have the answers yet. Uh, so the anti-corruption people are actually giving him the latitude and saying, well, you know, he's, uh, we'll give him more time. He's uh, made an explanation, but we can't tell you. And the head of the anti-corruption agency is, is one of his uh, loyalists. Um, he's worn this, these watches for some time. This military government has been in power since May 2014, and uh, now they're not getting away with anything. Every small thing becomes a big problem. Before, they can do all kinds of things, including crafting, arranging for the crafting of a very crooked constitution. You know, the reason Thailand speaks after Myanmar is because Myanmar is ahead of Thailand. Uh, the, con the constitution of Myanmar gives a quota of a 25% quota to the military. The constitution of Thailand gives a 33% quota to the military. Uh, so this crooked constitution <coughs> uh, marginalizes political parties, um, politicians, and so on, and gives power to appointed uh, uh, committees and agencies, and the military will get to appoint the entire Senate, the entire Senate. Nevertheless, before, when they were doing all of this, 2014, 2015, 2016, 2017, nobody said too much. They got away with it including a referendum on the Constitution that is very crooked in August 2016. It also passed. 59% of the people turned out to vote. 61% voted for the Constitution. So this government has stayed too long. This is a problem. The military government in Thailand, they were supposed to be in power to be the midwife of the royal succession. And before um, the passing of uh, the late king, his majesty, King Pumipon, before the cremation on October 26, 2017, before that time, it almost seemed like they could do very little wrong. After the cremation, into 2018, I noticed that every small thing becomes a big problem for them. So this is why I think they're under, under mounting pressure and then they will have, have an election somehow. So before the election, uh, it's been pledged for November 2018, um, uh, it could be delayed. I mean, we've had f several major delays. He, you know, he told the UN, he told Prime Minister Abe, General Prayut, and each time it's been delayed. 
But uh, if there are delays, I mean, it could come from the, uh, Her Majesty the Queen is uh, advanced age, perhaps. Uh, uh, that could be a factor. Perhaps um, the organic laws won't be ready, but all things being equal, the mounting public pressure for election will be immense. They'll have to have election somehow this year. So before the election, they will manipulate the political landscape keeping their major parties down, promoting their own middle-sized, mid-sized parties, and probably trying to get themselves in power after, after the election. So this is what we have uh, in the lead up to the election. Uh, the transition from military government to some kind of elected coalition government will thus take place. I, I think that this year uh, will be very hard to avoid. Uh, that is one one transition that we will see. The second transition is a more structural, fundamental transition of Thailand, and that is, uh, uh, for the first time, I'm a little bit wary and excited at, this, at the same time this year. For the first time, uh, the pattern that we've seen in the recent past may no longer hold. So it's normally, you know, you don't have to stay tuned to the Thai headlines, you just know that they're the yellow shirts and their red shirts, you know, this goes back to 2005. So the pattern is very clear, it gets repeated and recurrent. The Thaksin Chinawat parties, they win the election. He's had three parties. We've had two military coups, one judicial coup since 2005, 2006. So the Thaksin party gets elected, they take power beginning, beginning in 2001, and then again they got re-elected for the first time one party rule for the first time, completed a full term uh, as a one party, as a same party for the first time in 2005. 2006, protests in the streets, the yellow shirts, there was a military coup on September 19, 2006. So they wrote a new constitution, the coup makers, the committee that they appointed. Um, the constitution led to election in, in December 2007. The Thaksin party, second one, after being dissolved, won the election. So they took power. The yellow shirts came back. The yellow shirts came back and uh, eventually they got kicked out again, this time by a judicial coup, including a 10-day closure of the international airport in Bangkok. So then the, the opposing party, the Democrat party, led government in 2009, 2010. Then you had the red shirts coming in because they had been disenfranchised. So they protested in the streets, they got dispersed in April 2009, April and May 2010. And then time was up, 2011, they had to have election. So election, the Thaksin third party, Pur Thai party, won the election, right? So they took power under Ying Lak Shinawat. And uh, for a while, it looked like they might stay for some time, maybe a complete a full term, but of course, uh, that government tried to introduce an amnesty that would have absolved Thaksin's crimes and uh, wrongdoings. So the yellow shirts retook to the streets, uh, made Bangkok ungovernable, late 2013, 2014, military coup in May 2014. Now, that coup is interesting. So the 2006 coup was like the same coup, but they didn't do it right. So it was 2014, it was a, you know, a harder coup, same people, same generals. And um, they, they really had the idea of taking power at that time because the royal transition was imminent, imminent. Uh, the king had been hospitalized for a long time and at a very advanced age, it looked like it was imminent. And a lot of people, politicians, civil society, academics, you know, all kinds of people, even the Red Shirts, they didn't oppose the coup in May 2014. So these guys had some legitimacy. I think they had initially some good intentions about overseeing this transition period, this succession period. And it happened. So finally, you know, His Majesty passed October 2016, and then cremation 2017, but they don't want to leave. So the second transition that we will have to see, apart from military government to elected government of some kind, is what happens to, to Thailand in, you know, with a new monarch, established monarchy, new monarch. What happens to the military, the monarchy, and a kind of democratic system that has to come into place what kind of balance it will be. A uh, new monarch is not like the, his father, so uh, it will be a very different kind of uh, Thailand. I'm excited and wary at the same time because the pattern may no longer hold. So if you win the election this time, 
people go out on the streets, whatever color, they say, okay, I'm doing it for the king and a protest, you leave, eventually you're going to lose. The late king has such immense moral authority, has such popularity that, you know, if you do something in his name, you'll, you'll get the um, uh, sort of uh, legitimacy and eventually you'll get your way. But this time, untested. So if you go, you get elected, you have protests in the streets, I don't know what will happen. So it's exciting to analyze Thailand because maybe it won't be the same pattern I've been sick and tired of since 2005, you know. Uh, the yellow and then yellow and then red and red and tucks in and then, you know, he does all these things that he does and then he gets kicked out and he comes back again. Well, this time, things are uh, for the taking. I think that all bets are off, uh, all to be played for. So the constellation of uh, the Thai protagonist uh, is unsettled. I think that this is a kind of a, a sizing up period. Uh, new monarch, the military wants to cover his back now. Uh, he wants to stay for the long haul. Civilian politicians are agitating to come back. Uh, civil society also wants to have a say. Uh, so we will, we will see, and this is the third part, the last part is what will happen, what to do, how to get there. We will see very messy year in Thailand. It, it cannot be anything but messy. Messy and it will be ugly and nasty. On the other hand, uh, it's like that everywhere, in most places. The only place, you know, I, maybe in Norway is nice, uh, maybe uh, New Zealand, they still have some social peace. Singapore, by these standards, not bad, not bad. Over the decades, it's had a lot of criticisms, but I think that in, in hindsight, compared to what is going on now, uh, Singapore may have just kind of got it uh, the, the right mix, the right moving mix. Uh, for Thailand, it doesn't have the right moving mix. Uh, and, and other countries also uh, are seeing some, some nasty polarized politics. So what needs to happen in Thailand is that Thailand in the end has to come up with a 21st century constitutional monarchy with some kind of democratic rule that is sustained. The problem, the problem is that elections People keep asking me about elections. Elections are not tantamount, not equivalent to a democracy. They're very different. They can be very different. You have to have elections, you have a democracy, but after you have it in Thailand, you will not have democracy that you think of. So I think what needs to be done is the bridging of this, this gap between elections and democracy, the strengthening of political parties, the accountability, the responsiveness, the kind of quality politicians that we see in Singapore. What needs to happen? is that we would like to have, you know, Thailand has never had, we only had two completed parliamentary terms in all of 85 years. 1990, late 1990s under the Chuan government, but they had two governments, uh, so 96 to 2000, and then the Thaksin, first Thaksin government completed full time. So it would be nice in Thailand, it would be critical and strategic to have an election and have that parliament last a full term, have a couple of elections without a military coup, that's really how Thailand can get out of this hump, but that will require some kind of a accommodation, concession, compromise. Initially, some power sharing between the military. You know, in Myanmar and Thailand and some countries, militaries don't go away overnight. They don't go back to the barracks. It takes time. But there can be a civil military power sharing agreement, and over time, like Thailand had in the 1980s, um, the military can gradually fade away, civilianize, and then the civilian politicians have to become more accountable, responsive, effective, innovative, less corrupt. Corruption is uh, the weakest link, uh, the Achilles heel of democracy is anywhere. So that's, I think, uh, uh, where we would need to go. Uh, messy, ugly, nasty year ahead, and probably year after. I'm wary because this time it's exciting to be analyzing, but if it doesn't go well, we will see turmoil, confrontation, uh, violence in Thailand and there is no backstop at this time because the late king is no longer there so it's up for the Thai protagonists, characters, institutions themselves to find their own backstop uh, before you could say that you know the buck stopped with the king eventually all societies the buck has stopped somewhere uh, this time I don't see where the buck will stop uh, exciting to analyze but it also makes me worry about what could come uh, without some kind of accommodation and compromise, uh, we will not find a settlement and some kind of a lasting stability in Thailand. However, 
Thailand has gone through a lot. Violence included, 13 military coups in 85 years, not, not including the unsuccessful ones, all kinds of elections and parties and so on. And they're the kind of people that find a way to find a way. So I'm hopeful on that note that eventually, uh, not this year, but in the next few years, there could be some kind of a negotiated outcome that can resettle, reset Thailand into a new moving balance and a 21st century constitutional monarchy. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, and uh, I'm very grateful to the three speakers for, for the discipline. So they've all uh, kept uh, to time, which affords us uh, some time for, for questions. So can I open it up to the floor? Take the first question. Uh, uh, right here. Yes, yes, please. My name is Tim Mamondan from the ISIS Yusuf Ishak Institute. I would like to ask Dr. Tam Yeu a broad question. Do you think that the nation-making project in Myanmar has failed due to the top-down state-making process of the past? And in the narrowest sense, in the peace process, has the center of gravity moved from NCA to the Northern Alliance and China's rules? And this is the question for Mr. Wong. Um, there has been some call from the business sector for a stimulus, a sort of a fiscal stimulus for the stagnant economy, which is, I think is a dangerous move. Uh, that stimulus in the form of trying to make the shortfall, according to them, there was a, the private investment has fallen from double digit in terms of percentage of GDP to single digit. And the shortfall is something like 10 billion US dollars in the last one or two years. Mm -hmm. And they expect the government to do deficit spending on that. Would that be a smart move? I don't think so. Uh, can you please answer that? Can, can we get a question on Thailand? Then I can take uh, uh, a whole set. Don't have to. Uh, there, question from Thailand coming from? <laughs> please. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I'm from Thailand, so I would like to ask Professor Thitin Nan. Has there been any change in the quality of Thai voters, especially those in rural areas? Well, from outside of Thailand, we heard about the awakening of the Thai rural electorate. But is it really happening? Or uh, is money politics will continue to be the most decisive factor in Thai politics. Thank you. Uh, you want to start? Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for the question because I actually skipped over what I was going to say on the on some parts of the peace process. For those of you who don't know, we've had a nationwide ceasefire agreement that was co-drafted between the government and ethnic armed groups and, and first signed by some of the ethnic armed organizations in, in 2015. Um, and under this Doran San Suu Kyi government, there has been an attempt to get more of the ethnic armed groups to sign. Myanmar has something like 20 plus ethnic armed organizations, as well as maybe 500 to 800 militia groups on the Thai and Chinese border. The thing to understand about where the peace process is right now and the armed conflict is right now is that, very generally speaking, the armed groups on the Thai border have signed ceasefires, and in general, the ones on the, Thai, on the Thai border, there is very little armed violence in, in recent years. Where all the clashes have taken place and where we've seen a big surge in fighting has been on the Chinese border, where we've seen new armed groups develop over the past few years, and many of these armed groups, together with the biggest armed group, the United Wa State Army, which has over 20,000 armed men, have entered into a new alliance called the Northern Alliance. The government and the army want all of these groups, or some of these groups actually, to sign this nationwide ceasefire agreement, but the talks between the various parties on a possible signing of this ceasefire have been stalled. Um, I think it's 
very difficult, or let me put it this way, the second part of the question was about state building and nation building, and in many ways, I, I wouldn't say it's failed, but it's certainly not succeeded. After 70 years, uh, no government in Myanmar since independence almost exactly 70 years ago has been successful at pulling the entire country together. I think looking forward, we have to disaggregate between three very separate things in my mind. The first is how to stop the fighting in the northeast of the country on the Chinese border. And that is primarily an issue between the army and the ethnic armed groups on that air, in that area, many of whom have very close relationships in China. And it's very difficult, or it's impossible, to separate that question of a reduction in fighting or an ending of fighting in the northeast, where all the fighting is taking place, outside the context of where bilateral relations between Myanmar and China will go over the coming years. So that's one issue. The second issue is the issue of federalism or greater autonomy or self-government in the regions and especially in ethnic minority regions of that country. That is a constitutional issue that in many ways should be more up to the elected representatives of people than to the armed groups themselves. So there's an issue of constitutional reform towards a federal constitution. The third issue is something different, which goes to what I was talking about before, which is, can we come up with a more inclusive identity where everyone in Myanmar feels that they are Myanmar citizens and a part of the country? And that overlaps with the issue of the armed conflict in the Constitution, but is separate once again. Is it possible for Myanmar in the 21st century to craft a new Myanmar identity where all the different peoples of the country, regardless of race or religion or ethnicity, can feel a part? And that is something which I don't think can be done in a state top-down way, but has to include a much wider set of, of stakeholders and, and, and people. Thank you. Thank you for the question and allowing me to expand a little bit on that um, uh, item. Uh, actually, the fiscal um, deficits, governance deficits, are basically elevated. But um, in my mind, they are not excessively so for a country that is in the early stages of putting in place very basic infrastructure and power uh, um, and all the other hard uh, uh, infrastructure in place. Um, in my mind, the overall debt levels of the country are not high compared to other countries, simply because uh, Myanmar was not able to access um, uh, funding in the last 20, 30 years very effectively. So I think um, I would, if I were to make the call, I would say um, they can have some scope to raise um, uh, uh, spending on infrastructure. But I think the immediate thing um, uh, for bumping up uh, government coffers uh, uh, would be to think about ways of uh, improving the liquidity as well as uh, tax revenues. And what comes to mind um, and has been discussed um, a little bit is actually giving a tax amnesty um, of some sort, a calibrated one, so that the excessive negative impact from tax amnesties do not actually um, fall to the other sectors of the economy. Uh, right now, um, the liquidity has basically dried up um, uh, in, 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 in the Yanmar economy. Banks are not lending because the NPLs are at least, at least, and I, I, I emphasize this, 10 to 12 percent, although they won't admit it. Um, uh, I think they're much higher. Um, and, banks, uh, are base, uh, and banks are not lending simply because um, even if somebody had the money, had the funds to repay his loans, he would think twice about doing that, simply because um, you would have to show that it is white money. White money in Myanmar is money that is proven to be clean or taxed. If you were to buy a piece of property, you would have to show that it is white money, otherwise you will suffer all the normal taxes plus another, I think it's 25 or 30 percent on top of all the other duties and taxes that you have to pay to buy that piece of property. And so the issue of white money um, prevents even lenders from repaying their loans, right? So the issue of white money is an issue which I think the government has to confront Tax amnesty is 
another issue that they might want to consider. But the essential thing about the Yanmar economy is that for an economy to grow at its potential of at least six and a half, seven, eight percent, you just don't have the liquidity to support that in the next few years. And that's absolutely um, clear in my mind. Thank you. Yes, uh, Dr. Thermsak's question has to do with uh, what, what has really changed uh, in Thailand in terms of uh, uh, voting behavior and Thai voters. Uh, we haven't had elections since July 2011. So it will be most likely more than seven years uh, by the time the election takes place since we had the last election. So this will be the election in seven, the last seven years. There has been a proliferation of uh, social media technologies and uh, smartphones and so on. So it will be interesting uh, on one hand, you know, what kind of election, what kind of results we will get because um, this time everyone, most everyone in Thailand now have some access to, to information they didn't have before. Uh, on the other hand, the patronage networks in the outside Bangkok and also in Bangkok uh, and uh, these patron client ties, the money politics that, uh, that was mentioned uh, is, still, is still also prevalent. So, so th there has been some realization awakening over the last decade, but it's been limited to the structure of the patronage system. Uh, I would say that uh, part of the problem is that political parties have not been able to uh, have not been allowed to and, and able to strengthen, uh, to, to institutionalize, because parties have come and gone. The, 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 the strongest party had an opportunity to really go far ahead was the Thaksin party, and of course that was dissolved twice. And now the third one could also be dissolved. The party that could really go far and be allowed to go far would be the Democrat party. But uh, if you look at Thai politics, you know, the politicians are pretty much the same people. There's no new faces. And with this constitution that is so uh, lopsided, um, uh, it makes it very difficult, for, uh, unattractive for anyone to enter Thai politics. So it's not that Thailand lacks talent. There are a lot of uh, smart people in Thailand, a lot of talent, uh, young people, but uh, no one is drawn to politics because the rules are very stringent, very rigid, uh, and the provincial networks are very deep-seated. So overall, I, I think that we will have election in order. People are looking for the election in order to have a change of government. And then come what may after that, eventually there will have to be a major makeover of the constitution. Uh, otherwise, uh, you cannot get a, any kind of uh, legitimate outcome that with an effective government. This constitution is written uh, for a stalemate. Uh, in fact, it's a kind of a time bomb because once you have election, nothing will work in parliament. Thank you. Uh, we're, we're almost back on schedule. Uh, can I? Uh, I'm sorry, we're, we're out of time. Um, can I uh, uh, ask you to join me in thanking our panelists, please? <laughs>